God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. So what does uh, what do these two verses tell us? There's a curse. There's a blessing and a curse, which kind of feels like the Old Testament, right? But I'll tell you what it does to me. It makes me extremely nervous to teach this book. And I am not, you know, I, I really respect those who have gone before, who have studied this. But one of the things I want us to see this morning is that people are all over the map on this book. And that drives me crazy because one of the goals I have in preaching and teaching is to make the word accessible <laughs> to common people. And too often what I think happens in, in the way this thing is interpreted, you would have to have a theology degree to even understand half of what people are saying. Do you believe that the first century people had that much trouble understanding what this book was about. Me either. So, our goal this morning is to talk about something that I don't know how many of you have heard of. One is we're going to talk about hermeneutics. And the reason I want to talk about hermeneutics is because, and I know it's man-made, but these are common sense rules for looking at things like apocryphal literature. So we've already had two classes on understanding it, and understanding it's a different kind of literature. Now I want to talk about how do you look at it, and then I want to look at two of the four prevalent uh, interpretations, and these two interpretations are pretty prevalent among brethren. And Wednesday night, I want to look at two interpretations one that used to be prevalent among brethren, and another that's pretty prevalent in the world, and so as you encounter your friends and neighbors, that's what they're going to think it looks like. Hopefully, that'll help us as we begin next Sunday to delve into the text, okay? With me so far? All right. Hermeneutics. When I went to college, there was a standard text for hermeneutics. It was written by um, Dungan, and it was published in 1888. So these are not new rules. And these rules existed before Dungan wrote his textbook, but they were basically accepted as the common sense way to look at prophecy or <coughs> metaphorical language. Now, the first thing that the author stresses in his textbook, and, and I loved it because as I got older, I began to understand this better. What is the most important aspect of biblical interpretation? I heard context. You know what we do? We always go in and look for the technical thing first, but what Dungan stressed is good common sense is the first requisite. This is so evident that to present it further would be a waste of time. And I think one of the things we tend to do with the Bible, and at least we see this with a lot of people we come in contact with, is that I need to suspend all the rules of logic and reason to read the Bible and the Holy Spirit will inspire, will help me to understand it. He will help you if you pray and ask for it, but you're still expected to use common sense when you look at the Bible. So, the first thing rule is let the author give his own interpretation. A good example of this is in Ezekiel 37.11. You have the vision of the valley of dry bones. So what is it about? Ezekiel tells us in verse 11, 
Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. That's who it's about. And they, behold, the house of Israel says, Our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. So the whole point of the vision is that God can take what appears to be an unredeemable Israel or a dead Israel and bring it back to life. Whatever else we think of the vision, that's its meaning. And why is that? Because the writer told us what it means. The second part, which speaks to what Wes brought up a minute ago, is that whatever our interpretation of metaphorical language, it should agree with the general scope, general and special scope. That's a fancy way of saying that what context is under discussion, okay? So for example, there's a historical context. What did it mean when people first read it? What did they think it meant? And then there's another context, and I love D. Bowman's advice to preachers because I think this fits here, which is before you use any passage or any verse, read the four verses before it and the four verses after it to see if you're in context. Sometimes that's a rule, it sometimes takes more than that, but that's what we need to do. That's how you begin to understand what you're looking at. So for example, with hy hy hyperbole, why haven't you pulled out your eye? Why haven't you cut off your hand? Jesus said to, did he not? <coughs> why have you not done that? It's okay to speak up. I know it's Sunday. I know it's the morning. I know it's rain. And there's no trick question here. <laughs> Why haven't you done it? Ask the person offend you. Pardon me? Ask the person offend you. Well, no, well, it's okay. If your eye and your hand haven't offended you by this age, but anyway, <laughs> yeah. That wasn't his intention. Wasn't his intention. What was his intention, Dan? To show you that sometimes you do need to do extreme things for the sake of being like that. Right. And how do you know that? By the other things he said. Yeah, the context of that is, <laughs> is really important, right? Now, rule three compare figurative with literal accounts of the same thing. There's a reason why you would consider, can fit, compare a figurative with a literal account. Because if your figurative interpretation contradicts the literal, you're wrong. Right? It can't be different than what God revealed clearly. Then there's rule four. You interpret metaphorical language by the resemblance of things compared. So think about Revelation 5. What is Revelation 5 about? If you've been reading it, you should know what I'm asking. This is a text. Okay, the lion of the tribe of Judah is worthy to open the seal. How else is Jesus described in Revelation 5? Slain lamb. As the slain lamb. What? How is Jesus both a lion and a lamb? John said he's the lamb of God that comes to take away the sins of the world. Picture of the Old Testament. Okay, but what is it saying about Jesus? You're right. The Old Testament predicts that he would come to take the, away the sins of the world, but what message is it sending us specifically about Jesus in that passage? He's our, he's our ruler as well as our Savior. Yes. He is mighty as well as weak. Right? What is a lion? He's mighty. What is a lamb? Weak. And both of those things, he uses them to rule us and to save us. You see? So by the resemblance of things compared, you can learn a characteristic about Jesus. 
Is that not described in literal terms in other books? It is, right? But when we see that in the vision, we know what they're trying to convey about Jesus. By the way, those two things together made him worthy to open the seals, right? He had conquered, and he had been a sacrifice that brought all peoples and nations and languages into the kingdom. He made it possible because through those two things, he wiped away our sin. The fifth rule in looking at metaphorical languages is to by use the facts of history. And the facts of history and biography may be made to assist in the interpretation of this figurative language. So I'll give you a classic example because Shane's already gone over it for us. Nebuchadnezzar's vision. Or the vision that Daniel had in Daniel 7 or 9. How did he know who those four kingdoms were? And how do we know who they are? It's more, how do we know what he's talking about? Some of them were told us and the rest of it in the history of life. Yeah, some of it was told to us. The rest of it, we were able to look at history because when we look at the four kingdoms, they came, you had Babylon, which was first, which we are told in the text, that's who it's going to be. We're told in Daniel that the Medo-Persians are going to be next. Then we're told that a ram is going to come from the west and defeat the east. How do we know who that is? What even specifically mentions that it's Greece. It says it's Greece, but even more specifically, we even know who the ram really is. Yeah. It's Alexander the Great, because Greece came and did that. Where did we learn that? Through history, right? And then through this fourth empire that seems to crush and tear apart everything that gets in its way, and yet has feet of clay. Feet mixed with iron and clay. Who in the world could that be? The Romans. And if you know the history of Rome, you know they go through periods of being really strong, then other times they get an internal fight. I mean, after Nero died, there were four emperors in one year. And how many times did they get into civil wars? And yet, the strength of the empire was sometimes its flexibility, its ability to be molded to fit the times. So, we know all that. We know that that's what Daniel's talking about from the context of history and the facts of history. Now, when we get into Revelation, there's a debate about history, at least in the way people look about it. All right. Any inspired interpretation or application of the language in the text, it reigns supreme in doing that. So what I mean by that is, when you're looking at metaphorical language, it's a lot like what we saw with Ezekiel. Any the inspired writer's exegesis of a passage is its meaning, period. Now, that's not so important in Revelation as it is sometimes looking at Old Testament prophecy. Because sometimes what happens, like in Acts 15, there are things discussed from Amos and Hosea and James tells us what they mean. You know what? Whatever I may think of Amos and Hosea and those passages, I know what they mean because James, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, tells me what it is. Right? Now, we must also be careful, Rule 7, we must be careful not to demand too many points of analogy. Not every feature of an analogy demands an interpretation. This is very similar to what we looked at in the pop, how to understand apocryphal language, that when you see a vision, do you need to assign meaning to everything you see in the vision? Talk about this being like being in a, in a theater or in watching a movie. It may be in a house, but the house may not have any meaning at all that's just there in a house. Right? 
Figures are not always used with the same meaning. I love what Dungan said about this in the 1880s. This is a very grave error among an untaught class of exegetes and compelling every word that has at any time been used figuratively to always have the same thought as in the passage. We talked about last Wednesday night. Paul used leaven metaphorically. Jesus used leaven metaphorically. Some of Jesus times that he used leaven, he was referring to evil. But he had one where he said the kingdom of heaven is like leaven put into a loaf of bread. In that case, you had to look at the context to know what the metaphor meant. But if you had gone through and just said leaven always means evil, what would you have Jesus saying in the parable of leaven? Right? So you can't do that. We're going to skip Rule 9 because it's not really relevant to Revelation, but Rule 10. The type and the antichrist type are frequently both in view at the same time. Wes pointed out last week that there is such a thing as called, at least among scholars, the prophetic perfect. What does that mean? It's, it's present now, but it's also present at future events or even an ultimate. Yeah, it's present now, and it may be in future events. I love Robert Harkwriter's illustration of this, which is a man looking at a view of the mountains. He can see very clearly what's in front of him, but there's mountains off in the distance. If you go to someplace like Colorado, it may be 90 miles to that next mountain. You may not see it, but I can see what's right around me. Clearly, the prophet sometimes has that in view. Okay, lots of rules here. I will do what I did Wednesday. I will share this deck, or at least the notes, with you. So, if you have any questions about any of that? <coughs> Everyone clear? You're going to remember those? And will I remember them every time we're looking at something? Not unless I go back and look, but these are pretty helpful, okay? <laughs> so there are four prevalent interpretations of Revelation. It's not possible to look at every possible thing that anyone has ever said about the book of Revelation. I'm bringing these four up again, like I said, because the first two are prevalent in the church. Some in the church may still hold a continuous historical. There were a few that held the futurist. So, <coughs> let's look at what you probably heard as the late date. Okay. Now, there are people who hold this view, and I'm indebted to Robert Harkrayer for this, so this material is not new with me. But two, pos two people who hold this view are Homer Haley and Jim McWiggin. Now, Jim McWiggin, if I remember right, is uh, from Northern Ireland. He's written a number of commentaries on uh, books such as Ezekiel and Revelation. But what you need to know about this is that, that this one really believes that Revelation is about is is all fulfilled in the fall of the Roman Empire. Okay. So things to keep in mind about this are that politically Christians were under severe persecution. Now I will tell you that others recognize other interpretations recognize that. But one of the things we want to keep in mind is that politically they had no standing. And by the time Paul, wanted, if you argue for the late day, by this time, Paul has had his trial before Caesar. And it's pretty much easy to establish this by history, that once the Romans understood that, Jew, that Christianity was not a sect of Judaism, it became an illegal religion. Now, they might have been aggravated with some of the things Christians were doing before that, but it was seen to be a view 
to be a sect of an ancient religion, and the Romans historically allowed ancient religions to exist. So they had no problem with the cult of Isis, for example, out of Egypt, because they considered that ancient. They had no problem with Judaism per se, because they also considered that ancient. But they also considered worshiping Rome, the goddess Rona, and Saturn, having Saturnalia, or the worship of Saturn, to be pretty foundational to the empire, because they believed that that was their gods who helped form the city of Rome and the empire. Okay? But Christians were being persecuted first by the Jews and then by the Romans when the Romans figured this out. The other aspect of it, as Judaism became, there's something that we tend to forget, but since before the time of Christ, there was an active terrorist organization resisting Roman authority in Judea. And while this is all going on, in both this this prophecy, or this interpretation, and the historical preterists do recognize that there was a revolt in Judea. Now, whether a Christian is part of a real illegal religion or a sect of the Jews, how do you think Rome reacts to revolts? Pretty negatively, right? Now, the other aspect is that this takes into account that Christians were accused of being atheists. To that, that just sounds weird to us in our modern years, because what do we think of as, a, as an atheist? You can respond. Don't believe in God. Don't believe in God. Well, do Christians believe in the gods? Or No, they rejected that. And the whole idea that there was only one was very foreign to pagan ears. Because pagans believed there was a pantheon of gods. And so, when you refuse to worship the goddess Roma, what's wrong with you? Or you reject the Lord Caesar in favor of the Lord Christ. How do you think your life is going to be? And the other thing is, they can point to some, and we see this in Revelation about the synagogue of the Jews, or the synagogue of Satan. The Jews had come up, some of them living in the provinces, had come up with a mental reservation. In other words, I can go over here and put a pinch of incense on the altar to Lord Caesar, but I don't mean it. I just know I have to do that in order to get along in the culture. Do we ever do things like that? And can you imagine when someone comes along and says, I'm not going to do that, how unreasonable they look. The other thing that's hard for us is to view is that that was viewed as unpatriotic and a threat to the empire. Because you don't worship the gods who are foundational to the founding of this great empire. And so that was viewed as being subversive. You remember when uh, the Christians were brought before the authorities in Thessalonica? <coughs> what the accusation was? They go around teaching everyone not to observe our customs and teaching that Jesus is Lord or Jesus is another king. That was already in, in that was already being said when Paul was teaching in Greece. And so that's something we have to keep in mind. I think this stuff is important regardless of whether you're late date or early date. And evil culture surrounded the church. You couldn't even participate in society when you began to withdraw from paganism. I mean, when I visited Pompeii, one of the things I always thought, kind of like we think in modern terms, 
Well, I know there's prostitutes, and I know there's brothels. I don't go there. And we have zoning laws to keep it out of my nice neighborhood. But when you're in Pompeii, the brothel is in your neighborhood because it's such a such a part of the culture that if that's what you want to do, you just go over there. You don't even have to go far. You can walk right over and come right back home. And I think sometimes when we look at Paul's writings, what usually is at the top of every list of sins that Christians are supposed to avoid? Now, before we get to We've taken it a step farther. Where is it now? Click. Does this have any relevance for us? And if you were a Christian in the first century, the military force, the political force, and even people you think would be somewhat sympathetic to you, the Jews, are all against you. How does it look for the survival of this religion? Or for the church? One of the things that Revelation 13, 4 says, who is like the beast? And who can fight against it? I think that's in there for a reason, because what would Christians think? Do we ever, looking at our culture and the things that are going on, ever just shrug and say, well, what can you do? That's just the way it is. So, and what did Rome usually do with someone who resisted their power? Or wouldn't play nice. They crucified people, folks, and even though Jesus was pulled off the cross the same day, most of the time that was not the way to handle it. They made sure that people were crucified on a public thoroughfare and left there to rot. And when you walk by and you smell the sense, the smell of death, and you saw that body hanging on the cross, or you tried to avoid it, the one thing that was planted in your mind is, I better not revolt against Rome. I think sometimes we don't have a realistic picture of the world our brethren lived in. All right, so there is a living message. And we need, as we go through this, through Revelation, we need to know the lessons that are intended for those originally addressed. I need someone to look at Revelation 14, 12. Revelation 14, 12. And I will show you an example here of the kind of messages that really, in fact, we'll read 12 and 13 because I believe this is a message that transcends the interpretation of the book and it's a living message for us today. So who would like to read that? I got it. Okay, go ahead. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from the labors and their works follow them. So, what's the message here? <coughs> Be faithful unto death. And, does he mean death, death? How do you know that? Dead and dying. 
Yeah, blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. The definition of dying in the Lord is keeping the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Does that transcend whatever it is? Is that a me I shouldn't say transcend. Is that a message that applies to us? Definitely. So one of the things I want us to take away, no matter which position you take, is look for those lessons that mean something today, that mean something to us. Are we beginning to feel pressure to do differently? Would that, would this be helpful? Yeah, it's like no matter how how things are going and what people are telling me, I need to keep the commandments of Jesus, the commandments of God and my faith in Jesus, because Revelation 21.8 tells me if I don't do that, I'm coward and faithless and I will not be in Jerusalem. Pretty sober, but it does have, and so, but there is, even a message that transcends that, which its theme is still true today. The kingdom of God and truth will triumph over Satan. Now, I will tell you that in this next position, which is sometimes referred to as the early day, I'm sorry, I'm not there yet. I want to jump ahead. So, why is this why is this particular interpretation one that we ought to consider? Well, it was written by, it acknowledges that it was written by John for the encouragement and edification of Christians of his own time. Okay? Revelation was written in symbolic language, so it knows not, it doesn't take things literally. Exception to this is chapters 2 and 3. This method says the apocalypse begins in, in chapter 4. And the letters to the churches are then positioned as an introduction to the apocalypse. So if you're in Sardis, here's your introduction to it. All right? It uses Old Testament language with New Testament meaning. Okay? So for example, John uses, as, as Shane pointed out, John used terminology from Ezekiel and Dan Daniel. And John adapts the Holy Test Old Testament language to the message. Now, whenever I say that, I understand, I believe it's the Holy Spirit who is doing that. And to understand Revelation, we must grasp the visions or a series of visions as a whole. And it attempts to understand all the difficult passages in the light of clear teaching. So this goes back to our rules. Our interpretation must agree with clear teaching, and I think that those who advocate for this are doing that, and that all the interpretations must be consistent with Bible teaching. Now, one of the reasons why I want to send this out is I just wanted you to see that, for example, um, if you look at this, you have the letters to the seven churches. Here's the two people who advocate for this, but one of the things I want you to see, some things they agree on, but some things they don't. And they're both arguing for an, a late date for the letter. And this is something you're going to see all the way through. Just that it doesn't matter which position people take, but they don't even agree among themselves about what these things mean. So, for example, both of them believe that, that the beginning of the actual revelation is in chapter 4. So look at the fourth seat, the first seal on a uh, horseman on a white horse. They believe one, Homer Haley believed Christ going forth in the gospel, but uh, McGiggins said Jesus is going forth as a conqueror. Look at the 144,000. Haley advocates that it's the active faithful on earth at any time where McGiggin talks about it's the righteous on earth. 
the great harlot. Both of them see Rome as the great harlot, but Haley advocates that it's just the city of lust and sedu seduction, while Rome is viewed as a commercial power by Yale. There's not wide variation here, but there are some differences. And the New Jerusalem, the church is, uh, Haley argues that it's the church at home with God and final glory beyond the judgment, while McGigan says it's the church on earth as triumphant and dedicated by the family of God. Okay, I'm going to ask if you have any questions. I'm not going beyond that. All right. Historical predators. <clears throat> All right. This, do you know what preterism is? I'm using a big term here. Tell me. What's that? Tell me. Okay. <laughs> According to preterism, all prophecy in the Bible is really history. The preterist interpretation of Scripture regards the book of Revelation as a symbolic picture of first century conflicts, not a description of what will occur in the end times. A pure preterist believes that everything in Revelation is fulfilled. Everything in Matthew 24 is fulfilled. A true preterist would believe that Jesus is our, the second coming has already occurred. Okay? I believe brethren that hold this position of the early day and see its fulfillment and the destruction of Jerusalem or what are called partial predators. So a partial predators is one that believes that the prophecies in Daniel, Matthew 24, and Revelation have already been fulfilled and were fulfilled no later than the first century AD. According to partial preterism, and you can tell this is written with somebody else in mind, there is no rapture, and passages describing the tribulation and the Antichrist are actually referring to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 and the Roman Emperor Titus. Partial preterists do believe in the return of Christ to earth and a future resurrection and judgment, but they do not teach a millennial kingdom or that the nation has a place in God's future plan. So, there are two proponents of this view. One is Foy Wallace Jr. And I think it's always good to know that when Foy Wallace wrote his interpretation of Revelation, the predominant issue in the churches of Christ at that time was premillennialism. Okay? So that would kind of, what would he be trying to prove? that premillennialism is not true, okay? The other is Arthur M. Ogden, and I don't believe that he was writing with that view. And so there's some really important differences between Hoyt Wallace and Ogden. Now, here's some things that I think are good about this, and I want to be excruciatingly fair here, that they also agree with biblical truth. They respect the basic rules of biblical interpretation, accepting possibly using Old Testament language with New Testament meaning. They would probably not argue for that. The dates of the writing of Revelation, they would say, were prior to AD 70, and they, they um, use internal evidence to prove that the book was written prior to that day. And they base it primarily on the teaching of Jesus regarding the destruction of Jerusalem in Matthew 24, Mark 10, Luke 17, and Luke 21. So the strength of this is that they are showing that biblical prophecy agrees with one another. Now, if I told a late day person that, they would say, well, we believe that too. Okay, so your head can spin after a while. Uh, Dan, they would advocate that Daniel's vision in chapter 7 of the saints being pressured by the beast are Old Testament saints. Now, I'm giving this short shrift and 
I have not studied this extensively, so don't ask me questions about this, okay? But they would say that this was written during the reign of Nero, and it's based on Nero's persecution of Christians and the fact that the Jews were persecuting the church and what Jesus promised in Matthew 24 about the destruction of Jerusalem is that Revelation confirms that God is going to bring punishment on Jerusalem for its persecution, not only of Christians, but as being the place where all the prophets of God were slain. Okay? And as I said, this would be fulfilled, so they would say this is fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem. So, this is interesting here. Uh, the letters both, if you notice late and early day proponents, both believe the letters to the seven churches are literal. They both believe that the, the door to heaven, or I'm sorry, the open door to heaven means that this is the beginning of Revelation. So you start with the throne room scene, and both, both Ogden and Wallace would agree on that. Here's where some differences start to come with the first seal, horseman on a white horse. Wallace believed that Christ and the white horse and the four horses represent a panorama of war on Jerusalem described in Matthew 24, where Ogden said, Nay, nay, this is Julius Caesar coming on the scene to develop Roman Empire which destroyed Jerusalem. They end up at the same place, but they see it as a different thing. The 144,000, Wallace believed that's the true Israel, and when he says true Israel, only means the church is marked and preserved from impending judgments. <coughs> but Ogden believed that the 144,000 represent all the redeemed of Israel who died prior to the cross of Christ. Both believe that the great harlot is Jerusalem. Wallace gets a little more specific and says the apostate Jerusalem. Wallace says the new Jerusalem is the church on a spiritually renovated earth. And I can say the kingdom of God is on earth and in heaven. And it's talking about the new Jerusalem. So, if your head is spinning, I understand. I will send out my notes. I have a table that you can look at that contrasts the late date and early date. I will tell you, I have a prejudice toward one of these two positions. And not only that, I think they are the only two that I would be willing to sign on to. I will not, the next two, I would not go near with a 10-foot pole, but we'll cover them, okay? All right, thank you for your attention. <laughs>